Hello, and welcome to Istanbul FinTech Week. My name is Michael McGrath, Director of Global Regulations and Standards for OneSpan, based in the United States. And during this session, I'm going to be covering recent regulations requiring strong uh, customer authentication in Turkey. The two regulations that I'm going to cover in uh, a fair amount of detail will be the amendments to the law on payment and security settlement systems, payment services, and electronic money institutions. This is the law that really opens the door to open banking uh, within the Republic of Turkey. And the second is the regulation on information systems of banks and electronic banking services. So jumping right in uh, to the first law, um, the amendments um, took effect in January of this year. And again, this is the law that uh, serves as the uh, platform for open banking um, with the Central Bank of Turkey serving as the regulator uh, for open banking. And under the law, open banking and payment service providers uh, they're going to need to apply to the central bank to obtain the authorization to conduct business by January 1 uh, of next year. Uh, that's only a couple of months away. Uh, Turkey had decided not to develop its own open banking infrastructure and instead was really one of the first countries outside of the EU to adopt the revised Payment Services Directive, or PSD2. Uh, PSD2 within Turkey also took effect uh, at the same time the, the amendments did uh, in January. And at the core of uh, PSD2, as it relates to authentication, are the regulatory technical standards on strong customer authentication and secure communication. Users must be authenticated using a minimum of two-factor authentication, which is a mix of elements that would include possession, inherence, and or knowledge. The authentication of a user should result in the generation of an authentication code, a cryptographic signature of the transaction. The authentication code must in the case of remote payments, be linked to the amount and payee approved by the user. And the, very importantly, the user's cryptographic material must be protected from unauthorized disclosure. These are key elements within that uh, strong customer authentication uh, section within the, uh, what they call the RTS. And strong customer authentication will apply to customer initiated online payments as a result, most car pay, card payments and all bank transfers within Turkey will require strong customer authentication. So PSD2 is really about reducing the risk of fraud for electronic transactions and enhancing the protection of customers' data. For all electronic transactions, Strong customer authentication will mean the authentication mechanism must be constructed from a combination of uh, two of the th three things shown here. Uh, something the user has, which could be a um, maybe a hardware token or even their mobile phone. Um, something they know, uh, often a password, a passphrase, maybe a secret question or a PIN, um, <clears throat> excuse me and something the user is. Uh, this is typically a biometric data, uh, which would include fingerprints, uh, facial scans, uh, even behavioral biometrics or iris scans. So I'll briefly cover some of the existing classifications of uh, strong authentication solutions that are in wide use today. Um, one is um, two device authentication. Um, the, you'll see on the monitor, that would be the banking device uh, 
using an example of a, a web browser accessing a, a bank's website. Uh, the authentication, authenticators that could be used uh, might be a hardware one-time password device, uh, maybe a FIDO uh, standards-based security key, or even a Cronto um, uh, image. Uh, the, the next would be two-app authentication. This would have the uh, bank's mobile app on a, on a device, a smartphone, um, and a second separate authentication app. Uh, an example would be a Google Authenticator. The third would be one app authentication. Uh, this would be an integrated solution where the possession element would be the mobile device storing a cryptographic key used to generate that authentication code. And the knowledge element would be the pin on the app itself. Uh, Odia Bank, for example, has deployed this integrated authentication solution in their mobile banking app uh, and has uh, received uh, high accolades from their customers for their, their overall experience. And the third, the fourth example uh, would be like an out of band. Um, typically, this would be uh, a mobile phone receiving an SMS with an authentication code. Uh, the, knowledge, uh, the knowledge element in this case would be uh, uh, the pin on the app. So these are, these are four examples uh, that would satisfy the, the PSD2 requirements. Okay, and the, and the next regulation I want to discuss, uh, and I'll go into a little bit of detail, is the regulation on information systems of banks and electronic banking services. Um, this was uh, entered into the official gazette um, in March and took effect, uh, entered into force on July 1 of this year. And this, this regulation significantly impacts banks, auditing firms, technology firms offering outsour outsourced services to banks, and companies offering bank open banking solutions. The regulation addresses the establishment and management of information system of banks, information security, and electronic banking services. And I've provided a link to the actual regulation uh, that you uh, can view on your own. So I will cover some of the key components of the regulation. Um, each channel, whether that's internet, mobile, or even telephone banking is subjected to detailed regulations in terms of authentication and transaction security. There are numerous articles to this regulation. I'm only going to highlight a few of them uh, as they pertain uh, to, to some of the important authentication and security um, requirements within the regulation. So Article 34 mandates that bank staff and customers use two-factor authentication for customer account access and transactions. The regulation includes an example of using uh, the Turkish identity card in conjunction with a card's PIN or biometric data or the use of an electronic signature. Uh, the regulation also addresses uh, widely reported security issues associated with SMS OTP. Uh, these, uh, the banks are permitted to send a one-time password or verification code via SMS in, in the initial setup, activation, and reactivation stages of mobile banking application. However, banks cannot send an OTP or verification code via SMS to customers who have installed and activated the mobile banking application to verify any transactions during login or the session and use it as an authentication element. This regulation is very important. Uh, there's been very wide, widely reported uh, issues with the security of SMS OTP. And this regulation is really expected to shift banks away from using SMS OTP to more, solu more secure solutions like software OTP. Article 34 also addresses concerns regarding 
the security of the mobile applications themselves uh, that banks are deploying. The regulation requires that any software or mobile app offered by a bank to its customers for use in electronic banking services can be verified as the relevant bank. So banks must ensure that any software or the, or the app itself does not contain any malicious code and they must provide necessary patches and updates to the customer if vulnerabilities are detected. While the regulation doesn't specifically state that mobile apps must go any sort of mobile application shielding process to protect, to protect against malware, it is an industry best practice and, and many of the banks have, have started to pursue this route. Article 33 within this regulation requires the bank to implement transaction security mechanisms to detect and prevent unusual or fraudulent transactions within the scope of electronic banking services. And Article 30, 41, excuse me, addresses secure communication when using open banking services. Uh, these are essentially the same requirements that are embedded into the regulatory technical standards of PSD2 uh, that I mentioned earlier. And Article 43 addresses remote identification and trust to the third party. This permits a bank to use remote identification methods to determine the identity of a customer or a person acting on behalf of a customer through open banking services from another bank that has already performed an identity proofing event. These are key trust areas uh, to enable open the smooth open um, open banking. So that's all I, that's about all the time I have for today. I just wanted to highlight some of those key provisions of these recent regulations. Um, one thing before I let you go, um, coming this month, uh, is a, one spans 2020 global financial regulations report and um, which is a, a very detailed country by country um, uh, report highlighting recent regulations and laws impacting the financial services industry. The regulations that I just covered today are included in this in this report so please visit our website uh, later this month, and uh, you'll be able to access the report free of charge. Again, my name is Michael McGrath with OneSpan, and thank you very much for your time today.